Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the Cigna Mindfulness Break on Managing Stress. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. She is a connector, lifelong learner, an inclusive space maker, with more than 20 years of local government experience positively impacting organizations and community through authentic leadership and volunteerism. She's an ICMA member whose career path to local government includes serving as a high school government and economics teacher, a recycling coordinator, and city manager at several organizations in the state of Texas. She currently serves as president of the Texas City Management Association and city manager of Pflugerville, Texas, Please welcome Serena Breland. Thank you, thank you. So um, I am, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be with so many individuals that that have their own story to tell about why they serve and how they're using those talents to provide to communities um, across our great nation. Uh, today is a day that we not only celebrate the achievements of all the trailblazers that have gone before us, um, but we each forge our own paths as females empowering females, individuals empowering females as well. In the words of Jane earlier, my new friend here in, in Houston, Texas, show up. Thank you for showing up, it's, it's powerful. And I will also never look at WD-40 um, completely the same. So thank y'all for that, uh, that panel discussion earlier. I'll preface this by saying that all of the following are, are really just my own opinions, my own stories. Um, and not my employers. I hope that you take what you like um, and leave the rest, recognizing that we all have our different stories. You gotta see it to be it. I remember making the leap to quit my job as a government teacher and pursue a master's full time. I was selected uh, to a fellowship program that allowed me the opportunity to choose from local governments in the Dallas area to work for. Uh, that fellowship funded my tuition, but provided me a very low paying part-time position. And at that time, I sought to work out for work for a female city manager, which landed me in Greenville, Texas. And if you're not familiar with the distance between, between Dallas and Greenville, that is 60 miles from my home. And I have no regrets about the miles, um, except for that one time I did get pulled over because apparently it's unlawful in the state of Texas to read a textbook and drive, who knew. Um, but this afforded me to have that opportunity to see a female, Karen Daly, excel in that position. And it was critical to my path that I saw a woman in that position that I saw it. I knew then that to be it, I had to see it. At that time, it was hard for me to find someone that looked like me in that role. A couple of years later, I followed her to Sugarland, Texas, where I served as a director and she was my supervisor once again. I learned the importance of being irrationally passionate about what you do from her. A very different leadership style than what I was taught in the classroom or from various mentors in that path. I learned early on that one day I would have the opportunity to pay it forward. So thank you for allowing me to be with you today. When I, when I first started out my career, uh, my focus was really caring, like many of you, caring for and being responsible for our residents and services that were delivered to them. I, I even dressed up like a dinosaur in my early days of, of, of being a, um, a, a recycling coordinator at a landfill, um, which I was required to call it a landfill. I, I couldn't call it a dump, apparently. Um, but I visited schools to try to teach them about recycling. I'd, I'd even wear a hazmat suit and dig through their school trash including chocolate milk and everything that the children are at the little germ factories that they are. So good times. Over time, that has transitioned me, not being directly tied to those customers, but it has shifted me from being responsible and caring um, for customers to being responsible and caring for the people that are responsible for those customers. I am not in charge, but I am responsible for being the leader for the people in my charge. And that's very different. Knowing about my leadership style and communicating that has been critical. Uh, for me, if I can summarize it, it's empathy and inclusion and perspective. It's understanding that organizational decisions should be collective and employee centric. I do like to glance under a table in a meeting and make sure that we have varying shoes under that table. From flip flops to heels to work boots, to kicks, to chanclas, to cowboy boots, and even to wingtips. We all have walked paths in those different shoes and we have a story to tell and a perspective to bring. Seeking solutions that embrace and are inclusive of those varying opinions lead us to a stronger path to serve our diverse communities. But after I glance down at those shoes, I think about what are we doing in those boardrooms to make sure that the voices 
that people wearing those shoes are heard. Simply put, adding to all meetings, the questions to all attendees should be, thank you for being here. I recognize your presence, and I would love to hear any additional comments you have. In weekly one-on-one -on -one one -on -one meetings, we should be asking for further comments, providing a path for voice. If you are leading supervisors, add to that performance evaluation, how are you providing a pathway to hear your employees' voice? And for those of you that are new to entering those meeting spaces, make sure your name shows up in those minutes. But not only do we need to support the transition of women into boardrooms and decision-making spaces, but to mentor them in having a voice once they've rightfully taken that seat. To get diversity to, the ta to that table is only the first step, which you can make policy in your recruitment, such as have your supervisors never asked what a salary history is on an employee, because we know that women even dependent upon race make substantially less than men. We can use blind resume methods to remove names of candidates, and we can focus on promoting on potential, not solely on the past. Let me repeat that for those of y'all having lunch. We can focus on promoting on potential, not merely on the past. Last, last year, I read an article. Um, it was through BYU. You can Google it. BYU, I urge you to look up uh, the article, When Women Don't Speak. I think you will find this study well done, albeit the, the results are not too surprising. But as a reminder to me that we must share our voices, having a seat at the table doesn't mean that people are heard. And it definitely doesn't mean that that table has to get smaller. I've become very laser focused on this concept as it not only relates to local government meetings, but in everything that we do from, from PTAs up to the vice presidency, to Congress, to the US Supreme Court, I urge you to take under wing professional women that are earning their, their chair at the table to speak, to be heard, to be the voice of difference. We've watched President Har Vice President Harris take her elected seat at the table giving voice to many people that will follow behind her and praise to the women that have paved for her. So we should make room at the table. Some of you may not know me, I'm kind of a car girl for decompression. I know I should be doing meditation and other things, but my version of it is driving a, 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 a red hot classic car that's uh, a 1932 Roadster. And if you ever wanna show up in, in Austin, Texas, I'll take you cruising. It'll be our own form of meditation. But after General Motors named Mary Barra the CEO in 2014, an interesting trend emerged. Car manufacturers began associating leadership qualities like decisiveness and assertiveness with women throughout the organization. The same can't really be said for GM competitor Ford Motors, which has never had a CEO in 119 years. Simply put, Tapping women for leadership roles change how an organization perceives women. The article that I recently read shows that companies that elevated women to the corner office were more likely to associate women with leadership traits that have typically and historically been tied to men. The change in organizational language trickles down to junior levels. And quote by the author, as soon as you hire a female leader, it begins to break down stereotypes. The chances are that women you hire across all levels of an organization are going to be successful. The takeaway for me from that article was really simple, hire women. I urge you to check your policies for gender pronoun use and what descriptive words are used for in the, in, when, throughout the organization, no matter who is leading that team. We all have our stories of being in a room and overlooked because the assumption is that we don't belong. I don't think I have to share any of those stories with you. We all have them. I remember first reading last year about imposter syndrome and I flat out panicked my whole career flash in front of me. And here comes the waves of self-doubt compounded in a society that was really built to keep underrepresented individuals out and marginalized voices. So here I am reading about just another thing for me to be nervous about this imposter syndrome, even the word syndrome is, is a disease, I started to panic. Here I am trying to create pathways for voice and women are being told that they're phonies, which yes, it doesn't empower them, but it silences them. I remember taking my first seat as a city manager and looking around my office, I can specifically remember the day thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. 
But at the core of it, what I did know is that I love communities, I love people, and I put that first and we can do it. So this whole concept of imposter syndrome really bothered me. Harvard Business Review in 2021 produced an article that you can go check out because I think some of y'all may, this, this may hit a, hit a note with some of you. Check out the article, Stop Telling Women They Have Imposter Syndrome. It's powerful. Stating that overcoming that thought was not about fixing individuals, but to create an environment that fosters leadership styles. We are to fix the bias, not fix the women. I do hope that you allow me a safe space for the next few moments um, for a story and a little bit of, of time with you. I was, I was professionally having a hard time in 2021. Um, some of you that I know are on here know about that. Um, not just leading through a pandemic and civil unrest and every time I turned on the news, it was heart wrenching. And I'm trying to be this beacon of strength and hope for an organization. I often felt paralyzed by my privilege and position as we would talk about DEI work. I, I felt that because I identified as a white female that grew up in the, sur in the suburbs, I, I caught myself casting doubt. I'd ask myself, do I have too much privilege to speak up in a world that is hurting? And will my words come out wrong or will I be misunderstood? Will my own bias misrepresent what's truly in my heart? And I have a have I had it so easy that I don't have a voice? Fortunately, that same privilege provides me the opportunity to recommend policy, to engage with the public and to provide platforms and meaningful conversations past the cameras and past social media. There is no better time than now that we celebrate hearing each other, allowing mistakes and learning to grow. This past year, and now really two years, has been a great reminder that the story that we intimately know is not the only story out there. While I had the opportunity to work from home in peace and quiet, and many of our employees, they didn't have such opportunity. Our employees have struggled, as I've heard earlier today, struggled with homeschooling, caring for loved ones, the loss of jobs, the loss of family members. Our very nation seemed to experience this collective grief that was felt by just turning on the news. I've been swiftly humbled that my story is not the only story, that all of our stories together create an environment, a culture, and a sense of belonging. Yet that individual individuality of each story has a positive impact on differentiating us and celebrating that uniqueness. I won't go into details today, like you're my therapist, but I shared with you that I, I was having a hard time. I had a, a difficult relationship with two of my council members. Um, if, if we were in person, I think I could see some people um, feeling that pain of, of having supervisors that you may not be on the same page with. And to be frank, it, I don't think it had any positive outcomes in the near future, and I struggled. Every time I would look at my phone and saw a message, I would cringe. Every time I made a recommendation, I braced myself for a blowback. I don't think at the time that I fully understood the impact on my psyche. Last summer, I remember in, in June of last summer, I was about to take stage in front of hundreds of city managers of colleagues in the state of Texas where I was to be sworn in as president. I was proud at what I had been able to do and I was, I was really on cloud nine. And here comes that stupid email that I shouldn't have read. It wasn't necessarily the content of that email. It was the history. It was the trauma that I've been going through for some time to read it. And in that moment, I glanced at that, that, I glanced at that email from a difficult council member. And I was able to pause. After my heart was racing, my stomach is in nuts, I paused and I looked around the room and all that imposter thinking creeped up for just a moment. And then this glorious thing happened and it left. The time, this time it didn't make me doubt. This time I thought I'm worth more and I ain't your doormat. And that was one of the first times. So I, I hope that resonates with some of you that are feeling like that doormat. I, I've made some new rules for my life in the past, um, in the past year. So I'll share those with you. Um, and like I said earlier, take what you like, leave the rest. Number one, I don't have to show up to every fight I'm invited to. I'm invited to a lot of fights, right? I don't have to show up. Number two, if I get up off the floor, then I can't be a doormat. 
Number three, I've learned that when you're taking on that kind of stress, the first thing I think of now is know who loves me. That really crosses my mind often. I know who loves me whenever I start to doubt my own self based on other people's actions. And most of all, never doubt that your silence enables and your voice empowers. That story leads me to urge you to find your own way and make the way for others. So when I first got to Pflugerville, um, and yes, that's spelled P-F, we put a P in front of all F words. Um, when I first got to Pflugerville, it was three and a half years ago, I was at this uh, uh, welcome the city manager re reception, which by the way, I, I, I really can't stand the attention. I don't really love those things. I'm wearing three inch heels, which added to my great discomfort. Um, it was there that I was approached by one of our meter readers. His name is David. David's an African-American male, an army veteran. Um, he showed up and he first apologized because he was in a, a uniform and he wasn't dressed up. Um, he asked me if he could chat and I told him my feet are killing me. Of course I want to chat. So let's go sit down. I'd love to sit and chat. Um, I appreciated him for being there um, regardless of his attire. He, he absolutely seemed surprised. David shared with me, he said, you know, I, I represent my team, right? Uh, at a 400 person organization, he, he has probably uh, maybe eight people in his team and he was there out of great courage. And he says, I, I really think that we just want to be cared for to be appreciated. And those words still to this day, I think of often, I often remember that courage that he came. So fast forward a few months, I attempted a little exercise in my organization. I am not saying this was the greatest thing that I've ever done, but I assure you, I haven't gotten to where I am from success, but I've gotten here from falling on my face and doing things wrong many times. But I'll tell you what I did. I asked the organization, what would be your top changes? Everybody in the organization, what would be your top changes that we could do in this organization that would make you more effective or have more meaningful work. And oh, oh my goodness, they answered. They answered loudly. I thought I'd get like 10 responses. So I got over 200 separate suggestions, separate suggestions, more like 400. And then we narrowed it down to 200. And the one thing that I've learned is that if you're going to ask your employees what they want, you better be ready to answer, even if it's no. Because every decision that we make or that we don't make is a communication piece to the organization. So because I believe in this employee-centric concept and that I believe that they know better than I do what's going on in the organization, because I probably know 5% of what really happens half the time. But so because I believe that, I formed a, key, a team called Unbeatable Team. And my first request was to make sure that David was on it, the gentleman that showed up, the gentleman that showed courage. I called our first meeting at City Hall and David walks in and I noticed he wasn't in uniform, but he was in his Sunday best. He later leaned over to me and he said, hey, would you mind if, um, would you mind if I take a picture? Of course, sure, sure. Let's take a picture. And I remember he said, I want to share it with my family because I've never been asked to go to a meeting at City Hall, much less sit with the city manager. I remember it almost bring me to tears and recognizing that I, I often think of that experience and remember that people want to be asked to the table at the at the base of what we do, ask to be table, then to be heard and to be seen and to be honored and is absolutely our job to do so, to make the table bigger. When I first started studying the concept of, of vulnerability, specifically reading Brene Brown, I thought, well, that, to be honest, I was like, that looks kind of weak. What are we supposed to do? Walk around with our heads down and then ask everyone for help and tell us how terrible our lives are? I didn't quite get the concept early on, right? But as I looked at parts of our organization that were not being successful, I realized that the root of it was this inability to speak up, lack of being vulnerable. It was departments that no longer were being communicative because of fear. It was a staff meeting where it's task driven. And then you really realize there's real, really no good input which means there's no great output. Vulnerability is more about how do we create a culture where people have psychological safety and they are real with their honesty, where they can raise their hand and say, I don't know what I'm doing. I need help. Where they can say, I messed up. I have some solutions. What do you think? As I went on this journey over the past two years to see what activities I could do to correct that behavior and look at how do I show up with my employees to allow voice, I was introduced 
to a concept called the reciprocity ring. So these are all homework assignments for you. Go look up TED Talk, Adam Grant, reciprocity um, ring. Specifically after reading the book, Give and Take by Adam Grant with a group of city managers across the nation called the ICMA Athenians, I was really able to, to think about this concept. The, the, the research shows that people are either givers or takers or matchers. And what I've learned is that many local government people are givers. Matchers are more like they, they see quid pro quo. Takers, well, you know when, when you see them, they kiss up and they kick down, right? And so reading about give and take, I, I was able to really get into this. What really spoke to me was the concept of formalizing ask and giving in an organization. And I'll, 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 give you, um, I'll give you an example of that. What I do know that I learned from that book that I really believe in from being a former teacher and being in local government, it's that it's easier to win when everyone wants you to win. The book name is Give and Take, Give and Take, good stuff. So one of my favorite Athenians, Peggy Maris, stated our last meeting, start where you are. Here we are with all this knowledge. And I think of that often, start where you are. About eight months ago, I read this book called Huddle. There's another one, Huddle. And it occurred to me that I wasn't really being intentional about meeting up with strong women around me regularly. So I texted three gals in my community. One is a baker, one is an assistant provost at a college, and another one is a healthcare provider for medicinal marijuana cards. So it was the start of a very eclectic group. This wasn't a bunch of local government people, but it definitely was an eclectic group. I asked if they wanna do brunch once a month and to my surprise, they were really eager, immediately responding. Honestly, given the option to go big or go home, I actually like to go home. I, I actually prefer that. So I was really surprised at the response. This group has now grown to about 25 women and it's soul filling. And we call ourselves the huddle. We huddle every month. No real agenda, just, just togetherness. What I recognized was that this group text became an avenue for women to make ask. Didn't really mean for it to be, but you would all of a sudden get an ask from someone like, hey, who has a plumber? Does anybody have a reliable babysitter? And, and I realized that people just would pour on support. Not that that should be surprising. So three weeks ago, I did a group train ride outing and I told them I was going to do a surprise activity, which of course, then the barrage of responses like, of course you are, Serena, of course you are. After handing out paper and Sharpies, each person was to make an ask. What I find so funny is that women had a hard time focusing on the ask. They were more eager to get to the point of the activity where they get to give. By the end of the day, each person walked away with resources, Hello? contacts, a sense Hi. of relief. From asking if anyone knew an executive Hi. coach to how do I prepare for an aging okay. parent to help with assisting on a high school senior Please, for their next step. To to each of us felt that support. I am testing this reciprocity ring in our organization because I believe, and I share it with you because I believe it has power in, in creating a culture by where people can learn to ask and people can freely give. I do long for the day to not being introduced as the first female city manager in X city, as I've done it three out of four times that I've been a city manager. It's, I recognize that it's new for that community and it's new for younger professionals to see in our profession that women are being selected. What a day it will be when we don't have to add that caveat. But I also understand until then, I will accept those terms as it may be an opportunity for another female to have that same vision in rooms, not to just fill a chair, but to be heard. I want us to continue to focus that same energy in the arena of supporting those that are rising in the ranks. Focus some energy in organizations that intently place women in rooms, not to just fill a chair. Focus energy in training, recruitment, and retention of the women in those rooms. But as we are here today, I think about often, what if conferences were about conversations and relationships and not specifically content. So I urge you don't leave today without reviewing that attendee list and maybe start even your own regional huddle. It's powerful. We shouldn't solely pursue the benefits of networking. Those benefits ensue from the investments in meaningful activities and relationships. I'm gonna repeat that for those of y'all eating lunch. 
we shouldn't solely pursue the benefits of networking. Those benefits ensue from investments and meaningful activities and relationships. I think that that's greatly, greatly important. So I hope today that you're able to do that. I'm gonna leave you with probably one takeaway and then I'd be happy to take questions. So Laura, sorry if it's shorter than I thought, but I know that we're virtual a little bit different, we're good. I wanna leave you with a little bit of a takeaway. Something that's been very special to me is I think about the stories of David, when I think of the stories that I see in my organization where becoming a female city manager for the first time in a community, I'm starting to see department heads and others say, I can do that too where they, they're able to then join organizations like this that support them. I'll leave you with one takeaway. My father is a, a retired army colonel um, that was also a chaplain. Um, so yes, ha ha, um, I'm half army brat, I'm half preacher's kid, which resulted in many years of therapy. But all jokes aside, it was very unique and rewarding. But typically on a weekend, my dad's two best friends were um, a, a Jewish rabbi and a Catholic monsignor. So it, it, it sounds like the beginning of a really bad joke, but that was really just my, my weekends. I remember my father taking me out because we live in Texas, right? That's what Texas girls, I guess, do maybe when they're being raised out on a farm. Um, I wasn't raised on a farm, but we went out to my grandfather's. And I, I remember my father taking me out to this pasture to learn how to shoot a 22 rifle. He's a very patient man and very methodical, and he's very focused on safety. I remember him slowly, what felt like forever, sharing with me every part of that firearm. He demonstrated how to sight in a target, how to load it. He even decided to give me an ethics lesson on what to do if I actually harmed or killed an animal and to always have a plan. I remember getting more and more nervous as he went on and on as pretty soon he would want me to pull that trigger. And I remember raising that rifle and positioning it into my shoulder and making sure that I I looked down that barrel as he taught me to do. And then I remember stopping just because I was terribly shaking and I was frightened. And I lowered it and I said to him, but daddy, whew, I'm scared. And he put his arm on my shoulder and he said with great confidence and love, he said, baby, you just do it scared. So as we embark in 2022, like so many trailblazers that have gone before us and the ones pulling up their chairs to take a seat at the table by which we are making for them, I hope that you too, you just do it scared. Thanks for allowing me. Oh, Serena, thank you so much for just being so open and authentic and uh, doing the scared. Um, look at, if you haven't seen, uh, look at all the wonderful words um, and comments and compliments that are just streaming. Look, I'm getting kind of choked up myself. Um, it's fantastic. I, we do have some time. Um, anybody would like to raise their hand? Um, okay, Kathleen. Hi there, everyone. And um, Serena, thank you. I. Um, just was recently appointed as city manager. I've been an assistant city manager for about 15 years. I'm in South Florida. Uh, the circumstances under which I was appointed wasn't what I would have chosen, but nonetheless. And your comments about uh, your difficult, the difficulties you have with some of your uh, council people, I can relate to and um, literally brought me to tears and encouraged me to have my executive assistant come in and say, you have to listen to this. So um, I'm so glad that I participated today and that um, I, I feel a lot less isolated as a result of being on this call. So to everyone out there, thank you. Oh, Kathleen, thank you so much for sharing that. And Kathleen, reach out anytime. Y'all can find me on LinkedIn. My name is spelled really weird. So I'm the only Serena on the internet that is spelled S-E-R-E-N-I-A-H. My mom is Serena, my grandma is Serena, but they ain't on the internet. But you can find me pretty easily. All right, Serena, there is a comment, a question in here. 
um, and I'll go ahead and read it for everyone. It says, during that time, you had a difficult council member. If you could go back, what sort of advice would you give yourself in terms of mitigating the trauma? Wow, y'all going deep. Um, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, I sought, I sought mental health care um, during that time. Um, and, and so there, there were some tools that I learned in there. Um, you know, as a city manager, I think it can be some of the most difficult uh, conversations. Um, I wasn't great at it. I'm, I'm not, I, I've heard, I had mentors tell me, you need to reach out and make a phone call every week. I didn't have the courage to do it. Um, I, I wasn't in a good place to do that. It was, it was pretty rough. I wish I could answer you better, but here's what I have learned. When they quit talking to you, that's a bad sign. When they're, when they're talking to you all the time, that's really good. I usually talk to about four council members before 9 a.m. almost every morning. Um, and I have to remind myself, that's a good thing. I think when I first saw the signs that it was going south, I should have reached out. Um, I definitely should have. I'm, I'm not proud of some of my actions that I, I did um, throughout that relationship. I wasn't perfectly innocent, um, but I definitely was in defense mode. And I think that i I would really urge people to reach out to healthcare professionals for mental health to figure out how to, um, to navigate that. I apologize for not having a great answer. Um, I should have communicated more in the beginning. Thank you, Serena. Such important words um, to remember. Anne-Marie. Hello, I, I wanted to just say that, that your, your comments really resonate with me. Um, I'm a, a, a female manager, um, but I also have some female department heads working for me. And we've had, for some reason, and maybe it's just the level of vitriol that um, exists in our society now, we've had um, an increasing number of occasions of our appointed officials that serve on commissions just treating our staff, particularly female staff, with just outright disrespect. And it's hard to say that it's gender related or not, but it, it truly has, you know, we, we've worked really hard to create a positive culture in our organization. And it's been really hard to keep that positive culture going when people are, are literally just getting smacked around in public meetings. And I am, you know, trying to work to deal with it, um, but, you know, it, it's it's very difficult, and and you know, I, I think it's something, um, again, with just the way society is right now, and you're either with me or against me. Um, people aren't looking for ways that they can be more respectful, and it, it, you know, I, I think I'm guessing that we're all dealing with a little bit of that. Thanks, Anne Marie. I, I would say, I, I think if I can add to it, um, if this helps, I think I was trying to take it all on my shoulders. And I realized that there were other elected officials that, um, that could also do some support. I'm not saying they always will, but um, I, I should have relied on others. And I think I took on the, the burden um, squarely on my shoulder um, and didn't ask for help from, from the other colleagues. Um, and I regret that. Uh, but by the way, I no longer have um, two of those elected officials. And um, I think that that's, I'll, I'll be, I think we're in a safe space, right? We talk about that. Um, I'll share with you um, the realization of the trauma did not occur to me until those players were changed. Um, so if anybody's worried about me now, girl, I got it. I'm good. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, Kathleen, did you have something else to add to that? I saw that you you came back on screen. I wasn't sure. I did not, but thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to pay closer attention, I think, maybe. Thank you. So All right. Uh, and so, yes, uh, these recordings will be available and um, all you know with all the fantastic content from today uh we will kind of synthesize and provide just like we did last year 
Are there any other comments or something that I missed? Let's see, something just came through to me um, and I'll read it anonymously. It says, as a young female professional, what guidance do you have for individuals dealing with gender-based discrimination um, on top of navigating the local government space as a young person? Um, I, I really wanna echo James, you show up. And I, one of the early career advices that I had was um, literally get your name in minutes. You go to that supervisor that you have and you, you ask to serve outside of your role, ask to serve, show up in spaces where they don't expect you. And I think it truly comes from not second guessing yourself that have that assurance that you can do it. You know, there's research that shows that that women don't apply for jobs till we have like 100% of the criteria. Men will apply for the jobs with 40%. I think there's also an element that we, we impose upon ourselves that we're not good enough. And I, I beg you, get that out of your head, right? Like that, that you are absolutely good enough. That imposter syndrome is a load of crap. And just be able to be yourself, but show up in spaces where you're not expected um, and make sure your name is getting recognized. Um, I think it's important. Uh, Margaret. I think you're muted. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got the video going. I, I forgot to uh, to get the mute button. Um, you made a comment. Every comment we don't make is a communication. And I love that. And I was hoping that maybe you could go a little bit deeper in that, maybe give an example or two. Oh, the assumptions. For those of y'all that are sitting in like a, a director or a CEO type role, I hear all the time, like Serena said, and I didn't even say it, right? Like it's made up. It's kind of like mom said this, dad said this. But I've also recognized not only will they make up things that I say, they will really make up things that I don't say. And, and I really, and that's why I really focus on that silence is powerful. And, and, and I really believe that you have to show up authentically to say no, um, as much as I hate it, right? That you have to give the why of no. I think absolutely that, that absence of using your voice can be really damaging to an organization. And my staff is probably thinking, oh God, she talks all the time. She's never silent, but you know. Great question, Margaret. Thank you. And if you're able within your organization, I'll tell you some things we do in ours really quick. Um, we have a program called PF Serves. Um, I pay my employees 40 hours a year to go serve in their community. Um, and, and that's been pretty powerful. So if they wanna do, I don't really care who it's for, if you serve a, um, a nonprofit or a school, um, but, but I, I think we've got to, if you're a policymaker and in that role, you make policy that allows people to engage and have a pathway for voice we also pay for our employees, not just the insurance, but for mental health care. As I saw some of y'all um, comment on that, if we pay our employees the hours up to 10 hours a year, and maybe I should change that to be honest, up to 10 hours a year for preventative health care, mammograms, colonoscopies, um, we're, we're paying for your time. I'm not talking sick time, and I'm not talking insurance. I, I will pay for your time to be there, and you just call it your wellness hours, and we do that for mental health. I think policy can also help um, help drive that. And Serena, I just shared another anonymous uh, question I got and I will read it for everyone. Uh, what advice would you give if you want to serve in more roles, but you're shot down due to your age, gender, and, and how do you get heard? Um, Laura, I may ask you for help on that. I mean, I, I really think about there's a bigger issue if you're being shot down based upon discriminatory practices. I mean, if that's if 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 that's really the case, I mean, I, I don't know. This is come. I remember, I said take what you like, leave leave the rest. Y'all, I, I I've moved every two to three years in my career to chase the next job. Um, I might change my sandbox if that's happening. I may I I may look at at maybe I'm not in the right sandbox. Um, to begin with, and I may just change my sandbox. Um, if you're wanting to be in more roles, um, you find your right sandbox and you serve. I, I will continue to say you serve. You, you find ways to serve in, in places that you may not have served before. 
I really like that. And there was another anonymous question that came in about, um, you know, how do you, um, this is, what can you do if you've been shunned for speaking up? And I think that, you know, what you just said about changing your sandbox is, you know, probably the same approach, um, unless you've got something else to add to that. I don't, other than, I'm going to go back to, you don't show up for every fight. I don't have to respond to every comment made. Um, maybe the non-response is powerful. I do see someone ask, what would I, what was I doing before becoming a city manager? I was a director for the city of Sugarland. Um, and if anybody wants the wellness hours policy, I have that policy and, and, um, send me a message in LinkedIn and I can get it to you or the PF serves policy. I can get that to you as well. Uh, so here's kind of a question about um, Pflugerville since you've arrived, how have you improved that sandbox for your staff? And so like the question is really what's your retention rate like has, can you, can you share a little bit about that? I, I don't have the number in front of me, but here's what I can tell you. Last week we're in a meeting and I remember a gal spoke up because we, we do, I mean, we're probably a little different. I'm a little, I'm a little loving, right? They call me mom often. Every city I've worked in, I get called mom and I'm really confused by that because I'm not a mom. Um, so I finally asked a, a gentleman, why do you call me mom? Because he's an a, a African-American male and he's older than me. And he always called me mom. And I said, what, Unruh, I don't understand. And he said, you're like a, you're like a mom. And I said, describe. And he said, you love us unconditionally, but you'll beat us back into line. I don't know really what that means, but I'll take it, right? Someone in a staff meeting last week said, we never laughed before you. And, and to me, that was a little powerful that I recognize that um, if you expect 40 hours a week solid of all of your employees to be just dedicated to the mission, you're not going to get it. That you allow grace, that you uh, allow failure. And you make sure that you're using those words, that that communication piece is powerful. Um, so I say what, what has changed is that is that it's it's more forgiving. I would say that I would say the organization allows for forgiveness. And I love my team for real dream team. Uh, I wake up and count my blessings every day. And at night I go and I journal what I'm grateful for, and their names are often there. All right, we've got one more question uh, time, I think for this last one. Um, how were you able to be perceived as a leader instead of bossy? Uh, this person says, I tend to be direct with my staff as do some of the male leaders. However, I am perceived as more of a villain per se or rude. How do um, we overcome that? Right, so um, I think there's, I was also taught early in my career let's say you're sending an email to staff and you need them to do something. Um, a lot of women will say, hey, would you mind doing me a favor and doing X? So I've also learned you don't do that. You're kind and you're cordial, but you may say, um, I really need that report by the end of the day. Thanks for taking care of it. I appreciate it. Like, I, I really think that there's ways to, to not, I'm not gonna say I've never been called bossy, but I think also, and I, I, I wanna be very specific about language. When you are in a meeting, um, I know that on one-on-ones, I'll say, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? What can I do to make your life better? And what is your opinion on that? And so I don't think I ever come out of the gate barking directives. It is much more of a collaborative space. Um, and I don't think collaboration equals bossy. Um, you're going to have to make a final decision um, in, a, in that role. But before I make a final decision, I, I'm creating a safe space. I love that, Serena. Um, just the, and the thing that has stuck with me um, out of today has been you just do it scared. Just do it scared. Um, whether it's, you know, your story that you've shared with us today, uh, walking into that room full of people that call you bossy pants and sassy pants, like just, just go in there and do it scared. Um, work with your elected officials um, and just, you know, the lesson that you relayed about, well, if I should, you know, should have just responded sooner and, and, you know, found someone to work through with my mental health um, and putting together that huddle 
and you know all the amazing things you just do it just do it do it scared um that's one step closer than you were before so thank you so much serena for being here today